Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Al. I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank you, uh, Bob, for inviting me to this meeting here in Las Vegas. For any excuse I'll have to come to Las Vegas, I'll take. I, uh, I, he picked me up around, it was about four o'clock, and, uh, and I'm staying at, uh, at the, you got, I even stand at the Mandalay Hotel, and, uh, it's really nice. I, uh, it's a lot different than, uh, when I got so, when I was, uh, like the, my rent Friday night was like $183 for tomorrow night at the Manley Hotel. When I was a social drinker, uh, my rent, and I lived in Hawaii at the time, I was living on the, on the beach, uh, on the, uh, really not beach, on the swamp, down at Pearl Harbor, in a Quonset hut, you know, they had Quonset huts, and they, Quonset huts were built, they, the huts were there from, when they were building on Pearl Harbor, and then this lady took them over there, and she was renting rooms out, and my room there was like <laughs> thirty-six dollars a month. You know what I mean? And uh, it uh, it came a point to where I, I, you know, I couldn't make the rent. Yeah. You know? And uh, so what I did is I. Uh, I subleased part of my room to another guy, and I, you know, and I, and I forgot to. Uh, and the name of the place was called Samoan Village, and the reason they call it Samoan Village is because Samoans lived there. Uh, and I, I, like I said, the guy I forgot to check if he had a job, and Pete didn't have a job, so my landlady kicked us out. And so we moved into a, uh, they had abandoned a, uh, I, I want you to know that I wasn't an alcoholic at this time. I was a social drinker who was a little down on his luck, right? <laughs> and uh, there was an abandoned, the Seventh-day Adventist church had abandoned a bus on her property. And let me tell you, if the Seventh-day Adventist church abandoned something, <laughs> It's really bad. So uh, we moved in there, and my landlady, Mrs. Evans, let me give you an example of what she looked like. She was Hawaiian, and she was about uh, maybe 5'11". She weighed about 240 pounds. She wore a muumuu, and she had Levi's underneath them. And she had, uh, you know, that's in style now, in case you ever notice. See girls running down the street with a capris and a dress over the top. And so what happens is that she had a jungle gym helmet. Remember, the jungle gym helmet, and she had a bandana tied around there to keep the uh, to keep the lizards out of her ears, because she was uh, from the shark family, you know, and she, like she was like old Hawaiian. And so she uh, she found us in the bus. And she took a water hose and she chased us out with the water hose. So we run over to the next village. It was a Filipino village. Because it was a lot of Filipinos lived there with the, they're fighting chickens, you know, they're walking around, but they're going down and they're fighting chickens in their arms and stuff like that. And so, uh, we, uh, we rolled over this car that had been burnt. It had been burnt. And, uh, you know, they set it a fire, and so Pete and I rolled it over, and I moved into the back, and he moved into the front of the car. And um, and if you ever, anybody here, I saw a lot of new people here, a lot of new, right, a lot of new people. If you ever think about going out drinking again, don't uh, move into a burnout car, because burnout cars don't have cushions, you know. They're all burnt away. And so what happens is the uh, 
what happened to us, I lived there for three days, and it was just got to be too much. You know what I mean? It was, uh, this outdoor living would never make it, you know, because the, the car was underneath a mango tree, all these rotten mangoes, and, and there's flies as big as airplanes in Hawaii, you know what I mean? And I'm laying there on the ground, and I got this, and I, I loved, Thunderbird wine was my, I loved the bird. He used to call me just a boy and the bird, you know. Except in Hawaii, Thunderbird cost a dollar a quart. But triple jack wine cost 85 cents a quart. So for two dollars, I could get two bottles of triple jack wine and a pack of cool cigarettes, you know. But if I bought Thunderbird, I couldn't do that. It would just be two bottles of wine. And the important thing is they were both 20% by volume. You know what I mean? And I'd have drank donkey piss for 20. If it had 20%, I'd have drank it. You know what I mean? So that's, that was my feeling about that. So I rolled out of that car with my triple jack in my arms. And I rolled on those rotten mangoes. And I'm looking at these guys up on Cam Highway waiting to catch a bus to go to work in the morning. And I looked over at Pete. I said, Pete, I said, those guys are a bunch of squares. They don't know how to live. Ah, you know what I mean? Well, very sure, two days later, I got my last job while I was a practicing social drinker. You know what I mean? If you wanted to know if I was an alcoholic, just ask me. I said, no, I'm not an alcoholic. So I thought, therefore, if you said you weren't an alcoholic, you're not an alcoholic. See? And so what happens is, since I wasn't a non-alcoholic, the last job I got was babysitting for two bottles of wine a day and a pack of cool. And once in a while, she'd bring a bottle of Kamshatka vodka. And that was like a half a pint, which cost like, I don't know what it cost now, but at that time it cost like a dollar fifteen. And, uh, I was the living maid. I mean, there was no sex. Her name was Connie. I was the living maid with her, for her. I, I, you know, I would, uh, take care of her. I'd cook her kids toast, you know, and I, you know, I, Pour milk for them and stuff like that, you know, you know, and give them their, give them their rice krispies in the morning, and I'd get up with Captain Kangaroo and go to bed with a late late show, you know what I mean? And that was it. And then what happened is I got a letter, I got a letter from my uh, mom, got a letter to me somehow or other, and uh, that my son was adopted away from me, and the reason he was adopted away from me is because I hadn't contributed to the support of the child. See, and that happened somewhere around early October of 1963. And then, um, and I was babysitting. I, I was working as a living maid then. I mean, I, I was, not only was I cooking, but I never washed clothes, so I learned how to wash clothes and iron there. I remember one time I had a whole mouthful of clothespins, you know what I mean? You know, those little wood clothespins with the wire springs on them? I had a whole mouthful of those, and I used to get hit by the shakes. And I got, I was out there and hang stuff, you know, bras and panties on the line and after, and just scrubbing them, you know. And all of a sudden I just got hit by the shakes and must have spit them clothespins a hundred feet in the air, you know what I mean? But I wasn't an alcoholic. I was, just had a little problem drinking, you know, a little problem with my life. You know, but pretty soon there's a, there's a ship out there. Eventually things are going to happen. What's going to happen is Mr. Anthony is going to come up. Hello. Is your name Al Signs? Yes. Well, I have a million dollar check for you tax free. Or I'm going to write a song and make a million dollars from it. Or I'm going to write a book and make a million dollars from it. You know what I mean? I had all of these things in my mind that I was going to do, say. But what I did do was drink. Uh, I had that down pat. And, uh, what happens is I remember when uh, very shortly after that, President Kennedy got assassinated, and it, something happened inside of me. It just like popped inside of me, and I, I, I just, why him, and why did he live, and why did I, why did he die, and why am I still alive? You know, and it just shook me, and the combination of losing my son, and so I called up the Greater Council on Alcoholism, uh, to. Uh, to talk to him about a friend of mine that may have a problem, and he told me uh, to come up and see him. 
So I called up this old buddy of mine that uh, I used to live with down in Samoan Village, down this guy named Greg Yamaguchi, uh, to come and pick me up. And he picked me up and he took me up there. And I went and saw this guy, uh, Jerry C. Martelon, and uh, he was the uh, he was the I don't know, head of alcoholism counselor at that time. And he had a sign above his desk that says, nothing is more important than this person in front of me at this very moment. And I'm really very grateful that he adhered to that sign because he sat there and he shared his story with me. The guy was an alcoholic and he was sober 18 years at that time. You know, and uh, he asked me, uh, you know, did I think I was an alcoholic? I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know. He said, well, why don't you come back? And he asked me, what religion are you? I said, well, I was, I'm a, um, you know, I don't know if you're aware of it. If, if you're aware of it, if you're born a Catholic, you don't get a choice. You know what I mean? That means you're Catholic till the end of time. Even if you're reincarnated, you're a Catholic. You know what I mean? <laughs> you understand why they put in chapter 5, our chances are nil to get rid of our old ideas? You know, that's my favorite, incidentally, that's my favorite word in the whole book. My favorite word is nil. And it's probably since I'm in Vegas at the top. I have to tell you what it means. The word nil means is no chance at all. No chance. No chance at all until I get rid of my old ideas. No chance. Why? I mean, what does my old ideas have to do with it? Like when I was going to high school at Monrovia High School, well, I would go into it and I'd check, go see my counselor, Mr. Manning. Hi, Mr. Manning. How you doing? Hi, Al. Let me ask you, Mr. Manning, what courses here at school can I take that when I'm 30 years old, I could end up at Salvation Army <laughs> and going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings? You know what I mean? <laughs> what he'd say is, well, why don't you just keep on think the way, keep on thinking the way you think? Keep on thinking the way you think. You know, this program is remarkable because it talks about what we have to have, what we have to have is an awakening. That we have to have an awakening. And so what, in, in a sense, what is it really telling me? It's telling me I'm walking around asleep. I'm walking around unconscious. Let me cite you an example of unconsciousness. Of total... <laughs> Matt, how many times have you been to a meeting and heard somebody say, like, how do you stay in the now? What do I do? <laughs> what do I do to stay in the now? <laughs> Stand up in the basket of the room and ask them, what do you think you are? <laughs> You must have asked your head where you were. <laughs> or my favorite one. My favorite, my very favorite of them all is, how many times have you heard somebody say, I got a committee up there. I got a committee up there. And uh, they start giving the story. You hear the committee story. Everybody's got a little story, you know what I mean? You know, a little drama. They got a little story, and they got a committee story, you know. And when they get finished saying the committee story, you ask them. You say you had a committee in your head, right? Yes. Well, who told you that? <laughs> your head. <laughs> you understand? So what I got to do is I got to, where I found out. <laughs> So I found Alcoholics Anonymous with Salvation Army. You know what I mean? We all don't have to go there, but if you gotta go there, you can go there, you know. You know. It's like a hospital or recovery house. They have all one thing in common. The Salvation Army. Nobody there's an alcoholic. <laughs> They're all victims of circumstance. <laughs> it's not their fault. You know, it's not their fault. 
I remember uh, the guy, first meeting I went to, I'm, I'm, and this guy, uh, J.C. Marlon, he took me to see a priest. and The priest took me through the, and I went, took me to see a, he had me come back that night to see him. Then he took me to see this priest up in Hawaii. Guy's a real cool guy. He comes out with a pair of cutoffs, you know, and a, a T-shirt. And, and one of those things, you know, those things, the things they carry around their neck when they're talking, you know, when they're, when they're giving forgiveness and stuff. And so he gave, I went through the Ten Commandments and, uh, and I violated all the, it's Ten Commandments, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's Ten Commandments, I violated all the commandments, you know what I mean? And, uh, he said, uh, you know, he forgave me my sins and, and he told me I had to move out from that girl. <laughs> I had to leave my babysitting job. And so they put me in, you know, which I was ready to go anyway, you yeah. know. Her boyfriend was coming back from Westpac, you know, and he wouldn't like that. And, you know, even though nothing was happening, you know, I was just like, she was bringing me booze, you know, and uh, so I got into Salvation, I got into Salvation Army, and um, he said, they have meetings every Saturday night, and he said, there's a, uh, there's a chance that uh, you can make it if you go to these meetings. So I figured, oh, okay, I'll go to the meetings. I'll go there. So when I screw up and go out, I can say, well, at least I tried. You know how we got that down? We we go through life pretending like we're talking to our mommy. You know what I mean? Give me one more chance. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. See? And so I figured out, I would do that. See? So the guy, I the first meeting I go to, the guy who slept next to me led the meeting. You know, the guy... A real old guy. I think he was like 49, 50 years old. You know what I mean? And he loaded ice boxes and stoves on the back of trucks. And I had a good job. I worked in a dish room. You know, I stacked old dishes and, you know, and they'd silver, you know, um, silver plate stuff would come in with the silver peeling off and I'd stack that. I had a, everything categorized in there. And so, and this guy would, Go down to, I don't know if anybody here has ever lived at Salvation Army or been in the service or lived where a bunch of guys lived together, you know what I mean? But this guy used to pick all hard-boiled eggs and he'd bring them, you know, in his wall locker and then he'd eat these eggs. And this guy had the worst case of gas that anybody had ever seen. So when he read chapter 5 and he said, if you decide you want what we have, <laughs> and I was willing to only go to any lengths to get it. Like, who wants to get sober and move into the next bed? That's what. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that, you know. So the following week, I went to the same meeting. Dan, the guy's name is Dan McVeigh. He led the meeting. And I still didn't want what he had. See. But they said, announced at the meeting that a group of people is coming to town. Is going to come and put a meeting on for us. You know, like you guys go to prison and stuff. Well, a bunch of people in AA are going to come and put a meeting on for us, you know. And so I wanted, I'm going to, I want to see what alcoholics look like. You know, and here I'm living in the Salvation Army. Guys rolling around the floor, barking like dogs, going through DTs, you know, smoking through the holes in their throat like this and drinking at the same. And I didn't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, I think normal. Golly, I want to see what an alcoholic looks like. So I'm out there sitting in front of the mess hall, waiting for the meeting to start. And this is in 1963, right? And this is like, I don't know, like, I'm sure you over there remember, like Peter Gunn and uh, Richard Diamond. Remember those guys on TV? And they had those uh, real tight, tight leg continental pants and real sharp jackets. And, I mean, those are Ivy League. Well, this guy pulls up on the right-hand side of this car. It was this blonde that was so hot. We could, I mean, we could have a moment of silence just for her, you know, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, this, and this guy gets out from behind the wheel. And she slides over there, you know what I mean? Like, my eyes are like, you know, and, and he hangs his head in there and he gives her a kiss. 
And she drives off with this almost new car. And this guy walks in with a continental pants, you know, with a real thick and looking good. He's got a white shirt and a slim gym tie and button down collar and a real sharp looking checkered blazer and his, his hair combed back. When he got up there, read chapter 5, he said, if you decide you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, I wanted what he had, you know what I mean? I, I wanted that girl, that car, and that sport coat, you know. I didn't come in here because I looked at the serenity in your eyes. Oh, God, I want to be serene like them. No. I wanted that. So I went up to him and the meeting was over. The guy's name... And, uh, you know, it's really strange because I, every once in a while I'll bump into him at a meeting. Uh, the guy's name is Bud Tullifson. He don't mind me breaking his anonymity. And he lives up in Santa Paula or something like that. And uh, somewhere around there. And he went up, you know, I went up to him and uh, I gave him my, you know, we have our sad little dramatic story why we can't make the program. You know, we ought to set it to music, really. We have our sad little stories. And what he does, I went up to him and he looked at me and he went like that to my chest. He says, you take care of your number one problem, and everything else will take care of itself. And he turned around and started walking away. I said, hold on a minute. What's my number one problem? He said, now, this is for the new people, I'm going to tell you. He says, your number one problem is go to meeting every night for the first 90 days. I said, well, do I have to go every night? He said, well, how often did you drink? He said, I'll go, okay, I'll go every night. Remember I told you that word called nil? Our chances are nil to get rid of our old ideas. Where else would I have gotten rid of them? See, it isn't a bad, you just, I just can't get rid of an old idea and leave it because nature despises a vacuum. The only thing that I have to, but see, so I went to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. I saw that guy, Bud. Then I went to a meeting, out. the first meeting I went to outside of Salvation Army. I ran into a guy who I was stationed with there before in Hawaii. Five years before that, we were stationed there at Hickam Air Force to get based together. And so what happens is he was sober like six months. And he would pick me up. And he would took me, took me around to meetings. And it was really funny because he'd be driving down the street, we'd be on, our, be on our way to a meeting, and all of a sudden he'd have an anxiety attack. He'd have to pull over. And, <laughs> and then after he'd go through it, he'd, and we'd shoot on to the meeting. Well, he took me to, I went to meetings every night. I went to meetings every night. And, uh, and we, what got to happen, you see, is that our chances are no to get rid of old ideas. I got to hear New ideas. My sponsor took me out of Salvation Army after I was sober 90 days because he knew I was going to become institutionalized. And he took me into his house and he told me I could live at his house for free room and board for six weeks. But that at the end of six weeks, six weeks I'd have to leave because his penance towards God would be up then. I wouldn't count then, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I said, okay, the guy's name is Shep. He's still my sponsor. And so what happens is he'd get me up in the morning. I'd have to get up in the morning. His wife, she'd be going to work at 5.30 in the morning. She's to go. And she'd go down and she'd knock at the door. And I'd come up and I'd sit down at the breakfast room table. And that's where I got my basic training, you would say. Because what he did is he told me what the disease of alcoholism is. What it is, what it is, it's an allergy of the body with an obsession of the mind. It's an allergy of the body with an obsession of the mind. And there's people that miss that. And for the ones that miss that, what it is, it's an allergy of the body with an obsession of the mind. And what that means is when you're not drinking and doing drugs, you've only handled the allergy. What we are left with is a disease. He says, Al, you're left with a disease. And you know what the disease is? He says the disease is the mind. And do you know what the function of the mind is? And I'm going like, he says, thinking is a function of the mind. 
right? And I'm sitting there at his breakfast room table, freshly out of Salvation Army, you know. You know, I hadn't worked in the last three years, you know what I mean? Had a job. I deserted my wife. My son was adopted away from me. I was wanted for 18 felony counts in California. And I'm wondering, is he trying to tell me that there's something wrong with the way I think? You know, there can't be anything wrong with the way I think. I, I thought that way all my life. <laughs> Do you think there's a relationship between what I think and what's happening in my life? That's sort of like a karmic thing, you know what I mean? I was sober five years, you know what I mean? And I quit smoking. And I went straight from camel cigarettes and cools. I went straight to winter. I had twisties, apple fritters. Every time you saw me, I was eating something, you know what I mean? I was eating something. And I got up to about almost 250 pounds. And what happens is... For after six months, I realized, you know, that, you know, I'm not going to smoke. And so I checked myself into Overeaters Anonymous. And I found out, and I lost my weight, but I found out there's this relation. I don't know if this is pretty heavy for Vegas, but there's this relationship. Did you know there's a relationship between what you eat and what you weigh? <laughs> there is that relationship. You know what I mean? <laughs> And there's the identical same relationship <laughs> between what you think and how you feel. Identically the same relationship. <laughs> you know, I know why I drank. I probably drank the same reason because we all drank. We drank because we suffered. We didn't drink because we felt so good. We drank because we suffered. I drank because I was suffering. And what caused the suffering what causes suffering? You know, uh, like, what causes suffering is thinking. It causes suffering. You know what I mean? When you have low self-esteem, it's got something to do with the way you think. You know, if you've got low self-esteem, what's happening is you're operating, you and I, if I have low self-esteem, I'm operating under a false identity. For me to go, so, I mean, the biggest rip. How would you like to live your life and be cool? Do you know why we have to be cool? Why we have to be cool? Why I had to be cool? Because who I thought I was wasn't good enough, so I had to invent to be something else. Now, wouldn't it be a rip-off to go through your life and really never get to be who you are? See, that's part of the suffering. That's part of the suffering. And what the program does... What the program does, it, it puts us in touch, it puts us in, it lets us realize who we are. It gives us that experience. And it's a good experience to have, because that's who you are all the time. But see, what happens is we don't do that, because we're in darkness. We are operating, we're operating from a place of endarkenment. We're going through life unconscious. Saying. <laughs> yeah, I gotta watch out for that. Every time I think about the third step, number two, let me tell you the story about uh, let me tell you the story about suffering. In my case, but the chances are no to get rid of our old ideas. So until I got rid of the until I you never really get rid of old your old I never really got rid of my old ideas. I just became aware of them. You know, I became aware of them. Like an old, uh, give me an example of an old idea that causes suffering. My dad told me, whatever you do, don't hang around with Mexicans. If you ever want to find a Mexican, look in a welfare line or underneath a tree, they're taking a siesta. The only thing wrong is my dad was Mexican. <laughs> Say. And so what happens is, I saw myself as being, I mean, I heard that I was just like a small kid, like four or five years old, you know? And so the big people tell you that, you know? And so you figure they're not lying to you, it's the truth. And the next thing that happened is my 
you know, I got molested by my uncle when I was seven years old. That never happened to anybody in the whole world, but only to me. And I could never really tell anybody that. And I just saw myself. I don't know whether I, uh, whether I liked it or not, but all I saw myself is I was really dirty. I saw myself as being really dirty at the age of seven. And so I'm living in South Pasadena at the time. And, we, and we're going to, uh, uh, I'm going, you know, that's home of the John Burt Society, right? And I'm going to school there, Catholic school, and I heard that I was, you know, that I was born in sin. I mean, out of the gate, I'm a bad guy. I, I'm a, you know, I am n- unworthy out of the gate. But see, what happens is, like, if you take a magnet, there's a lot of metal shavings around it, and you put the magnet in the middle of it, the shavings collapse. So if I think I'm an unworthy person, I put the magnet of unworthiness across and all the belief systems of unworthiness collect around it to support that belief that I'm an unworthy person. So I see myself I see myself now as being a sinning, perverted, sexually perverted Mexican. <laughs> and I'm going to school with these other kids and I'm busy comparing myself to other people Unaware of the karma for comparing. See, the karma for comparing is sit up. You see what I mean? The brain had to sit up. Now, I'm going to get this guy in control. Now, how I'm going to get this guy into control is to have him compare himself to somebody else. And he will always be less than because that's the way it is. And he'll listen to me and I'll make him better. So, no, but despite how you compare yourself, but despite how I compare myself to somebody else, I'm always going to come out sucking hind tit. I'm a loser. Because that's the nature of that game. See, and how I know that is because I'm aware of it. Because I've watched it. I've, I'm mindful. I'm mindful. The very important thing that brings us into our own being is mindfulness. See, and, the, and the program creates that. But it creates it through us discovering ourselves. And so I see myself not only as being, uh, i busy comparing myself to other people, so all of a sudden I see myself as being really dumb. So as I cruise through high school, and I'm going to parties where all of a sudden girls are in the mix. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden you're really comparing yourself to other people. And all of a sudden I go into a room and I... And I immediately feel uncomfortable. And I tell you why I feel uncomfortable. It's because these people are phonies and they make me feel uncomfortable. You know, they make me feel uncomfortable. See? But the facts are, the facts are, is I go into that room and I can see these people and it goes through my mind as I look at them, they got it together and here I am, a sexually perverted, dumb, sinning Mexican. You know, you're going to feel bad. That causes bad feelings. You know what I mean? That causes, it's hard to, I remember the first time I made a pass at a girl. I asked her if I could put her in my, and there's a dancing class, I was 13 years old. I asked her if I could put my arm around her, she said no. And I wondered, how did she find these things out about me? You know what I mean? So you can see how that sin, how all that thinking caused me suffering. It caused, how that thinking caused me suffering. See? And this buddy of mine realized my dilemma. I was like 16 years old, and he picks me up with this girl. And we went to a, a drive-in in Arcadia. And, and I sat in the back seat there looking at her out of the side of my eye, afraid to say anything. And, um, and then we went from there to Fish Canyon and... Uh, him and his girlfriend were getting along really good. You know. And so he gives me a blanket and a bottle of Garrett's California White Port and asks us to go out. Well, I was like 16. I was getting cool. Then. You know, I had a motorcycle jacket. I had my, you know, it's important. I had my collar up like this, you know. You're hunched over like that. And I remember we used to go like, hey, man, what's happening? We really had to do that because we didn't know what was happening. You know, we did not know. <laughs> so, 
So I'm underneath this tree with this girl, you know, and I'm I'm just alerted. To, I just started smoking, you know, smoking, and so I'm blowing smoke in her face like a fire engine, so she know how cool I am, right? And uh, she grabs a bottle of Girls California White Port, and she drank the floor apparently. You know. She took that. I'm just. I mean, she kept it up there a long time. Then she handed it to me. I'm cool. My collar's up. Smoking a cigarette. My Levi cuffs are rolled up. I got engineer boots on. I mean, I got it down. I can't let her go drink more than me, so I took that bottle and I... I don't remember putting that bottle down. All I know is I had my arms around her and I was talking shit 100 miles an hour. You know what I mean? <laughs> and why? You know, why? What happens is all of a sudden that message sends her that suffering. Alcohol removed the suffering. You understand that? Alcohol removed the suffering. So now I can understand now after going to meetings and hear people share why people will stay sober a period of time. And they'll go out and they'll start drinking again. And the reason they start drinking again is because this, the suffering that they endure is so hard that they have to drink. They have to drink. And this is where the steps come in. You know, here's where the steps come in. I remember going to meetings, the important thing I was telling you about going to meetings every night. I remember the first time I ran into a guy, I used to go to a meeting in, in Waikiki. What time do I stop? Okay, yeah, man. Um, I was going to a meeting. I was going. I was going to a meeting at Waikiki, and uh, they we used to get letters from this guy and who was stationed and we talked there, and he'd say how, you know, how he was staying sober and how grateful he was to God and stuff like that. And there was no AA there, you know. It was just like guys getting drunk and reading funny books. That's all I do there, and so. After a year, he came back, and I went to the meeting. I wanted a guy's name was Gene Akamini. He came back, and I went to the meeting to hear him. To, you know, he was going to share everybody. It was a, a discussion meeting, and uh, he. I heard him saying he was grateful to the letters that he got when he was there. He was grateful to the big book, and grateful to his God as he understand him. So when the meeting was over, I went up and gave him a, a quick quiz. I gave him a quick quiz of. Uh, a catechism quiz, you know. And he says, Ali says, if you're a Catholic, he says, that's fine. He says, but uh, I'm a Buddhist. You know. So all of a sudden, what happened to me, is, see, this is what makes Alcoholics Anonymous different than a religion. A religion says it's in the book. Your answers are in the book. Alcoholics Anonymous says, you want an answer? Take a look. How many in this room are sober and are not Catholic, raise your hand. Okay? If God was a Catholic, there'd be no hands up. How many people in this room are sober and are not Christian? Raise your hand. Okay, if God was a Christian, these hands wouldn't be up. And that's the experience I had. See, I backed into finding God by saying that isn't God. That God isn't Catholic. That God isn't Christian. I back into that way to realize that God is nothing. You know, nothing is God. You know, the book says God is either nothing or everything. I want to ask you to, I'm going to play with your mind for a minute. Did you know there is no difference? Nothing and everything is the same? It's totally the same. If I was to tell you my message, see, who we are and what we are is we're all extensions of God. You know, we're all God and drag, say. We are. I'm going to tell you a little story. <laughs> a little story. It's a story about this family. The uh, mother went off to the hospital and had a baby. And she came home. And she brought the baby home. And they also had another daughter there that was around four years old. And the daughter says to the 
mom and dad. He said, oh, can I see the baby? Well, yeah, take a look. No, I want to be alone with the baby. They said, oh, no, we can't let you do that. No, please. She begged them, please, please. They said, okay. Okay. So they let her go into the baby's room. And they stood there by the door, keeping an eye on on her. She walked in because they just wanted to be sure. And the little girl walked in there like she's four years old. She walked in there. And she walks over to the crib and she licks, puts her hand over the crib. And she looks down and she tells the little baby, she says, Help me remember I'm beginning to forget. Help me remember I'm beginning to forget. We have forgotten. We have forgotten. And the experience we have now is remembering. Is remembering. But to do that, to do that, we have to proceed through the steps. See, like the fourth and fifth step, what happens is, what causes the greatest suffering is misidentification. Is misidentification. I'm going to gross you out, but it's the only real way I know how to show an example. Did I pick my nose or am I a nose picker? Did I scratch my ass or am I an ass scratcher? Did I knock on a podium or am I a podium knocking? Before I took my inventory, I would describe myself to you as Al, the nose picking, ass scratching, podium knocker. You understand? And I would suffer. The reason I would suffer is because it's a lie. It's because it's a lie. If you take, see, because like I said, I'm just like you guys. No, no different. We're all the same. We're all little extensions of God. That's who we are. Until I realize that, I have to you stop me trying to become something. It's more important to. Just, just hang out. See, take a look at this. Here I am. I'm an extension of God. I went over here and I picked my nose. I went over here and I scratched my ass. I went over here and I knocked on the podium. At what time did I become any of those things? There's only things that I did. Because who I am and what I am is extension of God. And I come from there. And I come from there. And I come from there. Everything I do is I come. That's that. I do that. I do this. I do that. And it doesn't define me. It doesn't define me because who I am and what I am is an extension of God. I was sober about 10 years and I had hit a wall. You know? And usually a lot of people, when they hit these walls, they usually say, well, I'm going back I'm going to do a hundred meetings in a hundred days. I'm going to take another inventory, which is great for alcohol. They love to write about themselves. You know what I mean? <laughs> love to write about themselves. You know, I'm going to take another inventory. You know, I'm going to do all of that again. You know, and when I remember telling my sponsor, and I remember Shep asked me, he says, "Well, Ali says, uh, how long are you meditating for now?" I said, "Well." I'm reading the 24-hour day book. He says, no, no, no. He says, that's called reading the 24-hour day book. So what I did is said, oh, okay, Shep, I'm going to go meditate. So I drove up in West L.A. I'm sure if you guys have been there, there's a place called the Boda Tree, right? I went over and bought three or four books on meditating, you know. And so I read these books about meditating. And I talked to people about meditating. And what that's called is Reading books about meditation and talking about it got nothing to do with it. You know what I mean? And so what happens is I went to, you know, I was, I was, I got so desperate. I went to the University of Oriental Studies. It was the Korean Zindo 
it's a, it's a Korean zindo in in uh, in downtown Los Angeles, Korea town, downtown Los Angeles. I went there and I saw this guy, uh, Shin Zing Young, who was a monk. He was a he went to Japan, loaded on drugs. A Jewish kid and went to Japan, loaded on drugs, and became a monk. <laughs> and he come back, you know, and he's teaching meditation there. And I went and talked to him, and he says, talk to me, and he interviewed me, that's what they call him. He interviewed me, and he said, you know what? He said, you have one of the most grossest minds I have ever seen. And I have a garden variety alcoholic mind, you know what I mean? And you know what he meant by gross is my, my mind was totally obsessed with drama. Drama. Do you know how you can spot, <coughs> how you can spot drama? It's not happening. That's how, it's not happening. My mind is totally obsessed with what isn't happening. And I wasn't worrying why I was feeling bad, you know what I mean? And so what he did is he took me, just make it really short, he stuck a candle here, maybe take a candle there, put a clock there, and sit there for ten minutes. The first two times I tried to do that, I couldn't do it. You know, my head just like wouldn't let me sit there. But the third time I was so desperate. The third day I was so desperate, I sat there in the bathroom. There was a mirror here and a mirror there. And I put the candle and the clock here. And I stood there and I focused on that candle, sitting up straight like that. For ten, and after ten minutes, it flew by like that, man. It was, wow. It was, I... It, had a, it was something. It was something. So what is the benefit of, uh, what is the benefit of meditation? You know, I mean, I meditate every day for half an hour. Um, I've been away on a weekend meditation retreats. This guy, uh, an incredible guy, a good book, if you've been sober a while, read it. It's called Eckhart, it's Eckhart Tolle wrote it called The Power of Now. Very good book. I went and saw him at Esalon and did, I did a three day retreat there with him. So. And what happens is the meditation does, it moves you into your underwear. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, you know, like, here, here. If I can just get right in here, God, if right there. If I can just get right in there, there, just here. The reason you want to get there is because that's where it's at. There is nowhere else. That's where God is. Nowhere else. Everything else is imagination. Everything else is imagination. Do you know why, I mean, why I walk through life being afraid for so many years? So many years? Why people walk through around in fear? Because they think thoughts that scare them. <laughs> No. It's, they think thoughts that scare them. They're busy. They're, it's like it's like every morning I get up. Well, I do a I do a process in the morning to get myself going. You know, uh, the first thing I do, first thing I do is uh, I, I meditate. Before I start meditating, uh, I start I do a thing. A thing I learned. It, it goes like this. It goes like this, I fully love and accept all of me. I fully love and accept all of me. I fully love and accept all of me. I do that ten times. I fully love and accept all of me. I fully love and accept all of me. I fully love and accept all of me. You know, the issue about me being Mexican and Irish, how do I handle that? You know, if God didn't want me, if God wanted me to be Italian, she would have made me an Italian. You know what I mean? She went, but God, what she wanted me to do, she wanted me to do Mexican and Irish. See, I just did it. See, I'll do it again. That's how you do that. <laughs> it's important, you know, it's important to want to be who you are, since that's who you are anyway. You, you understand that? I have a horse, and I found out a very important thing about riding a horse. You always want to ride the horse in the direction it's going. You know what I mean? So if you want to know what nationality you're supposed to be, catch the nationality you are. Do that. That's who you are. Do that, you know. And when you're young, 
when you're young, what do you have? You have you. When you get older, what do you have to, what do you have? Style. And what can be more stylish than being who you are? You know? And the, and the steps do that. The steps totally set us free to do that. See, God created his good, never changed our mind. We're good now. We always will be good. And we are good right now, and we are good right now, and we are good right now. If we would just take that time, maybe five, ten minutes in the morning, watch that candle, watch that clock, and observe your thinking. I'm going to shut up right after this. Observe your thinking, because what happens is, pretend this is me meditating here. And I'm my thought, right? Well, I'll be meditating when my Why, you dumb shit. Nobody appreciates you. What are you going to wear tomorrow? We're going to have for dinner tonight. What do you think they think about you? You know what I mean? And all of these thoughts, now for, if you take for a moment, you saw me walking back and forth behind there, these thoughts. At what time did I become those thoughts? I am not those thoughts. I am not the thoughts any more than I'm the things that I do in my life. What I am is the observer. You can't be, you have to make a decision. Are you the voices or are you the listener? If you're the voices, there'd be nobody hearing anything. You understand? So what we are is we're the listener. And what empowers us is the detachment from our thoughts. Is that detachment. My thoughts, you know, I'm not my thoughts. You know, it gives me a power. It gives me, it sets me free. And uh, I want to thank you guys again for inviting me up here to, uh, to talk and play a little blackjack. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.